In the year 1918, a man named Oswald Spengler wrote a book called The Decline of the West, in German, Der Utrangang des Abendlandes. Now, what makes this book remarkable is not the ideas that it proposes, because many of them are familiar to us, but the fact that it was written 100 years ago. In this book, Spengler talks about civilizations as organisms, just like you and me, only that they take longer to mature and die. Oh, but they do die. Oftentimes, when civilizations die, they are at the peak of their military power when they are assured of their survival and they are self-prideful. Now, in this video essay, I will talk about why Spengler and I both believe that the collapse of the Western civilization is imminent and why it will happen precisely within you and I's lifetimes. Let's begin. When people say that Western civilization cannot possibly collapse, well, I want to bring to mind that this is what every single citizen of history believed of their country at the end of their power, or even close to collapse. Additionally, Western civilization already has collapsed in the form of the collapse of the Western Roman Empire in 476 AD, and many of the same causes that caused the collapse of the Western Roman Empire are at currently at play in the West today, and will most likely cause a similar form of collapse. In this essay, I will break down five major reasons why I think the West will collapse, ranging from the least likely reason to the most likely reason, and what you can do, if anything, to cope with the impending collapse. Now let's begin. One thing that the Romans did not have to contend with that we do is climate change. Sure, they burned huge amounts of wood, deforested large amounts of land, and suffered droughts occasionally, but their impact on the world environment pales in comparison to the amount of carbon dioxide we are pumping out each year into the environment. Humans pumped about 36 billion tons of carbon dioxide in the year 2021. However, I do want to emphasize that the Earth naturally emits and absorbs about 100 billion tons of carbon dioxide each year, naturally, so it's not as if we're killing the Earth fully, we're just very slowly changing the Earth's natural climate. The closest analogy we have to the current climate crisis would be the Younger Dryas, which occurred about 13,000 years ago. The Younger Dryas is estimated to be the sudden cooling of the Earth that occurred over a period of several hundred years, which is actually incredibly fast in a geological time scale. And it appears that humans were able to actually adjust to the change relatively well, simply becoming more mobile instead of more agricultural. So in my humble opinion, climate change is far too slow far too minuscule to have an impact to cause the large-scale collapse of Western civilization by the year 2100. And humans have a tendency to innovate when faced with massive famine, so I have full faith that Western civilization will not collapse because we ran out of food. Additionally, most of the impacts of climate change will actually be felt outside of the West in poorer regions, so if the West can actually limit immigrations as harsh as it sounds, they'll be spared the worst of climate change. Now, another reason the West could collapse is simply because it's being left behind by the East. One thing that would be amazing to a casual historian from 500 years ago is the fact that the West is the predominant power in the world and not the East, because for most of human history, the East was the gravity, the center of gravity for the world. Everything revolved around the East in terms of resources, manpower, wealth, and just general power. This has a lot of parallels with the collapse of the Western Roman Empire while the Latin-speaking Western Roman Empire descended into economic crisis and infighting, the Greek-speaking Eastern Empire, which later historians called the Byzantine Empire, began to flourish and grow in wealth. This definitely contributed to the collapse of the Western Roman Empire as it siphoned resources and it increased competition. It resulted in the West eventually being overrun by Germanic barbarians. Now, the world today is definitely not the same as the Age of Rome, and with global economies being so much more interconnected than ever before, it would not be in the best interest of the East to crush the West economically speaking. Additionally, with the growth of China slowing down to about 2.5% per year compared to America's 1.5%, it is estimated that it would now take until around the year 2060, if ever in this century, to overtake America. With the slowing working class in most of Asia, it's most likely that many of these nations will stagnate in the middle income trap, and thus the West will retain its advantage over the East 
at least through the end of the century. The only way for the East to overtake the West is for any technological paradigms to take place. But that's a wild card, so that's why I kept this to reason number 4. A topic that many of you would consider taboo to talk about, but it's very relevant here and it's number 3 reason for Western civilization's collapse is the decline of religion. This has already happened in most of Western Europe, where the rate of religious city is below 50% in most nations, including the United Kingdom and France. While the United States is lagging by this indicator, it is still decreasing from an astonishing 91% of people being Christian in 1976 to less than 70% today. And just to keep in mind, the pace of this decrease was about 6% in the last 6 years alone. Spengler talks about the lack of religion in his book a lot. Essentially, early civilizations are often characterized by an intense foray into religion. For example, the Romans considered themselves extremely religious people, followed by a period of rationality and then an apparent resurgence in some other form of religion. So if you take a look at the Roman Empire, the collapse of the Roman Empire was indeed coincided with the adoption of Christianity as the official state religion, which happened in about the year 300 AD, only about 100 years before the collapse of the Western Roman Empire. What happens when you destroy the original religion of a civilization is that the original core values that the civilization was built on were destroyed and thus it makes them much more susceptible to decay and to rot. Now the only difference and where I disagree specifically with Spengler is that in today's society there is nothing replacing the lack of religion. There is no second wave of religiosity. Instead, people are actually more distrustful of science than ever before and also more atheistic than ever before. So we are entering uncharted territory and it's very difficult to say what the lack of religion will actually do to modern society. But it's very clear that the values of today are very different from the values of 100 years ago and the values upon which Western civilization was originally founded 500 years ago. Now of course I could be completely wrong and as we progress and perhaps towards the later half of the century we could see a massive resurgence in religion due to demographic changes which I will talk about shortly but currently we're looking towards a post-Christian society in most of the west and the rise of rationality. Now the second reason why I believe the west will collapse within this century is the economic inequality that is rapidly rising across the world. The closest analogy we have to this level of inequality in modern times is the Gilded Age, which is quite curiously very understudied in terms of American history. Shortly after the wreckage incurred by the American Civil War, powerful industrialists in railroad, iron, and coal stepped in and basically created massive monopolies and created the richest Americans to ever exist, even compared to today. However, there is ample evidence that the inequality of the Gilded Age is comparable to the inequality that exists today. In 1897, the richest 4,000 Americans of families in America, which was less than 1% of the American population at that time, held as much wealth as all of the other 11.6 million families in America at the time. Nowadays, the top 1% of America holds close to 40% of the nation's wealth. While the inequality of the Gilded Age led to massive rioting, marches, and the rise of populism, the inequality of today curiously does not lead to as many sweeping popular movements. One difference is most likely that the billionaires of today are much more discreet and also hold a much more favorable perspective among the world's population. This ties back to my previous reason of the lack of religion. When you focus on rationality, you are focused much more on the worldly accumulation of material wealth, and thus you will probably prioritize individuals who are wealthy instead of individuals who hold high religious status. But we must keep in mind that technology has also greatly improved since the late 19th century, so the poorest person today has more necessities and more access to food, shelter, water than the poorest person from the 19th century. So, the condition, materially speaking, will not be as dire for the lower classes today. And as we can see from the history, revolutions only happen when the people's basic necessities are infringed upon, such as in the French Revolution, 
where the lack of bread led to the final revolt and beheading of the French king. Additionally, entertainment options are cheaper than ever before, leading many people to be placated, so to speak, and to not think about the gross inequality that's present in this world and potential ways to fight it. This brings me to the most important and number one reason I believe the West will collapse within this century. Demographic changes. When you look at history, the main reason most nations collapse is because their demographics are sufficiently changed so that the population no longer feels the necessity to swear allegiance to the existing government. And thus, the existing government is either destroyed or changed beyond recognition. This happened with the Roman Empire where the final blow was, stuck, was struck by Germanic recruits into the Roman army called the Fiordorati. A so-called Germanic named Odoacer kicked the puppet ruler of the West from the throne and declared himself the new leader. No matter how integrated the Germanic tribes were with the Roman Empire, they were not Roman. This is very similar to the crisis that is happening today. In the West, people are not having enough children. Ukraine, currently being ravaged by war, was already projected to sustain a 22% decrease in population by 2050. Eastern Europe and Southern Europe overall will be hit extremely hard as well by demographic decline, with Poland losing 14% by 2050, Russia 10%, Italy 5%, and Spain 2%. The European Union itself will peak in population by 2050 and then decline. Germany, the beating heart of the European Union, is only sustaining its population due to immigration. There's a fertility rate of 1.4, which is less than the 2.1 that is required to sustain your own population. Again, immigration is the only thing that is sustaining the numbers here. Asia, which has driven most global economic growth for the past generation, is also suffering immensely. Japan, which is traditionally considered a paragon of the West and the East, and the current world's third largest economy will probably see a decrease of 15% in terms of population by 2050 and will have more people over the age of 80 than under 15 by the year 2030. China, the world's most promising nation, only has a fertility rate of 1.2. John Maynard Keynes, the eminent British economist, wrote that overpopulation was a devil. He said, I only wish to warn you that the chaining up of the one devil may, if we are careless, only serve to lose another still fiercer and more intractable. In this case he was right. Economic growth will stagnate, it will decline, and there will not be sufficient working class people to sustain the elderly population. Especially when you consider that most healthcare costs are sustained in the last year of life, you begin to realize that, no offense, Old people are extremely expensive. Wages will rise as employers compete for the limited amounts of labor and thus there will be more incentive to offshore those jobs into cheaper areas like India or Africa where there are still a lot of young people. Innovation will slow down as more, most innovation actually happens from the younger populations and fluid intelligence decreases as you age. Aging populations also tend to buy less than younger populations, thus there will be a smaller consumer market. This is going to be especially fatal for China, which is reliant on consumption to fuel its economic growth. The United States actually has a fertility rate of 1.9, which, although below replacement, can be sustained through intense immigration. Now the question becomes, is immigration a feasible solution to the problems of the West? In my opinion, it is not. It will actually be the final blow, the death blow, and the final key to how the West will collapse. In the same way that the Fiodorati were never truly Roman soldiers, simply Germanic ones imposturing as Romans, many immigrants to the West will not be actually Western. They will be immigrants from the East imposturing as Western. There's a very good reason why historians call the Eastern Roman Empire the Byzantine Empire instead of the Roman Empire, even though from a governmental perspective they had a continuity from the Western Roman Empire, the Eastern Roman Empire was totally alien in culture. They spoke Greek, they followed a different form of Christianity, the culture, the traditions, everything was different from the West. And so the current census of the United States of America predicts that by the year 2050, 
white Americans will be a minority in America. This is already happening. For under 18 Americans, as the largest population growth nowadays is fueled by minority immigrants. And this, my friends, is what will cause the final collapse of the West. Even if the government of 2100 claims itself to be the United States, it's very likely that the transition period that happens within this century will cause future historians to declare it to be a new America and to be a totally separate entity, just like we call the Eastern Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire. When in technicality, it was actually called the Roman Empire and never was called the Byzantine Empire at the time. I want to leave you with some words from Spengler in which he predicts the future of the 20th and 21st centuries, so you can judge how accurate he was for yourself. Let's begin. Ever since Napoleon, hundreds of thousands and literally millions of men have stood ready to march and mighty fleets renewed every 10 years have filled the harbors. It is a war without war, a war of overbidding in equipment and preparedness, a war of figures and tempo and techniques, and the diplomatic dealings have been not of court with court, but of headquarters with headquarters. The longer the discharge was delayed, the more huge became the means, the more intolerable the tension. This is the fashion, the dynamic form of the contending states during the first century of that period, but it ended with the explosion of the World War in 1914. For the demand of these four years has been altogether too much for the principle of universal service. Child of the French Revolution, revolutionary thought, and through as it is in this form, and all tactical methods evolved from it. The place of the permanent armies as we know them will gradually be taken up by professional forces of volunteer working soldiers, and from millions we shall revert to hundreds of thousands. But ipso facto, this second century will be one of actually contending states. These armies are not substitutes for war, they are for war, and they want war. Within two generations, it will be their will that prevails over that of all the comfortables put together. In these wars of theirs for the heritage of the whole world, continents will be at stake. India, China, South Africa, Russia, Islam called out new techniques and tactics, played and counterplayed. The great cosmopolitan foci of power will dispose of the pleasure of smaller states their territory, their economy, and their men alike. All that is now merely province, passive object, means to end, and its destinies are without importance to the great march of things. We ourselves, in a very few years, have learned to take little or no notice of events that before the war would have horrified the world, who today, in the year 1922, seriously thinks about the millions that perish in Russia. End quote. And as Spengler predicted, indeed, World War II was unlike anything the world had ever seen and still has seen thus far. Don't worry, my curious viewer. Collapse is not really as bad as you think. If you travel back to the days of the Roman Empire, the system of the Roman Empire actually persisted for hundreds of years after so-called collapse in 476. In many areas, including Italy, Africa, Iberia, and regions of Gaul. The Ostrogoths, who took over Rome, in Italy especially, actually went to pains to maintain the illusion of Roman culture. Remember, the day 476 was chosen by a British historian named Edward Gibbon in his book The Decline of the Roman Empire, and it was published in the late 1700s. So one cannot say that the date future historians choose for the collapse of the Western civilization actually means anything at all to the people living through that so-called collapse. But the five items I outlined in this video will contribute to something approximating collapse within this century. But there is nothing to suggest that even if collapse happens that it will be apocalyptic or even close to apocalyptic. For most people the world is relatively self-contained. They don't think in terms of civilizations or centuries, they think of their own lives. Spengler talks about how history doesn't really affect people whose lives are self-contained in their minds. But it's always interesting to speculate and to understand how future historians would perceive our time and Western civilization as a whole. Thanks for watching and make sure to subscribe for more great content. This is Scholar of the World, signing out.